welcome to Marin Poets Live. I'm Neshama Franklin. I work at the Fairfax Library and I love poetry. After this program airs on TV, it will appear on the Marin Free Library website as part of a digital archive which also features biographies of the poets and links to our collection. Today we feature Terry Phelan. Welcome Terry Phelan. Thank you. So glad to have you here and give us a Marin poem, which we like to start with. Okay. Well, I attended a concert at Marin Vets at the Civic Center, mm -hmm. and there was a, um, an alternative rocker who was performing that night, and he seemed very dismayed and shocked to have found himself in such a sedate setting, <laughs> and the result was rather hilarious. So this poem was, was my take on that. It's called Ryan Adams. Gorgeous words wheedled in harsh tones, the shock of bangs grown perfectly long to the end of his pointy, turned-up nose. So ridiculously gifted, it makes you want to cry. Hiding while playing in full view behind a guitar and piano, or out in front, his muscled legs in tight jeans straining toward the microphone. I don't think I'd f any of you, he spits from the stage at our upturned faces. The suburban audience surveys him warily, too cowed to tell him we wouldn't f him either, or to tell him, politely, to go f himself. He should be dead, all the cliched problems with drink and drugs, but he survived to be here tonight, oozing superiority from every pore, hipster sarcasm spraying the front row, his youthful, stupid, blind genius, like a hard white light shining out from the darkened stage. And so, like the indulgent parents we are, we forgive him everything. That's so punchy, and <laughs> what a fabulous juxtaposition. It's very hard, to, I, I, I would find it hard to see the poetry in that, but you got it, <laughs> it wonderfully so. Thanks. Another one, please. All right, I'm gonna read from my first collection, Husk. Um, Husk is mostly about four themes, marriage, motherhood, uh, midlife and Michigan, which is where I'm from. And so, um, all right, this is the title poem from the collection. It's a, it's a motherhood poem. It's called Husk, the idea being that, you know, we're used up in the process of giving life. Husk. One, the doctor said, you weigh less than one hamburger patty, but I glimpsed your fighter's stance. Bald fists swimming up to guard delicate shell ears your radar pulse shimmering in the black and white flurry of the video screen. Two, this is why this animal weight on woman's chest, starfish fingers curled into dimpled bud, this start and twitch dreaming of falls into bedside canyons, this downy skull and sweat with pulse and purpose lulled, wove into sleep and meaning. Three, Plump, with tender skin drawn taut over drumstick thighs, I long to gnaw on your fleshy arms, find sucker in that sweet band of sweat hidden in the crease of your fat rolled wrists, swooning to the sound of your sweet nature singing like a steady high note. You grow round and smooth, leaving me a husk of skin and wing. Four, was it enough? Are you ready to make your living, earn love, indifferent to how much work it took. I grew you backbones and soft discs, filtered blood, spun veins of finest blue thread. I know what this growth cost me, more than months, more than bulging veins and skin left flaccid. You stole life, stripped away vanity, left me vast and vulnerable. So this is what I wanted, something from nothing. And if you aren't worth it, I could never know. Wow, that moves into so many places, with the, starting with a hamburger, into a kind of a lullaby and praise, and then into exhortation. Whew. Very transformative experience, becoming a mother. Yes. <laughs> now, I wonder how long between the time of giving birth and the time you gave birth to that poem. 
Um, I'm guessing it was probably seven or eight years. It yeah. just was percolating in there. And, yeah, because yeah. it, I mean, it has that incredible immediacy, but I don't think you can get there when you, the flesh is upon you. Yes, no, you're too busy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Another one, please. Okay. Uh, this was written when my son was four. He wore a Batman costume for about seven months straight. Batman. It's been his uniform these last six months. Swirling cape, black rubber boots, a small dark figure leaping unexpectedly from living room couches. His masked headgear is perpetually cockeyed. The half face that peers out is pinched and purposeful. There are worlds to be saved from green-faced jokers. There are penguins in the subways. Once again, our hero arrives on the scene to save a cynical heart. Ah, yes. The cynical heart being me, of course. Oh, but of course, <laughs> of course. Yes. That's so delightful. More. OK, another mom poem. Um, to listen to this, I think you really have to think of yourself sitting in a parked car. It's raining really hard, and the windshield wipers are going. And your son or daughter is sitting to your right, dressed and ready for practice, soccer practice in this case. It's called Field Day. Practice had started in spite of the storm, despite the hard rain. Sure you want to do this? His eyes sparked. The car door opened, slammed shut. Wipers thumped a deliberate pulse against the glass. Between the beat of clear vision and the building blur, a speckled plane of youth at a dead run, joy. Between the beat of clear vision and the building blur, her heart was a ball in the feet of a boy. Mm. Yes. And that, did it come to you in the car? Or did, you know, yes, how immediate um, was that poem? Because cars are such incubators for us. They are, certainly. Um, most of my poems come out of some uh, intense moment or observation, something that kind of uh, strikes me uh, strongly. And so I go back and write about it either right away or eventually I go back and it bubbles back up. But I'm not a very disciplined writer in terms of day to day. but. When yeah. something strikes me, either in a sensory or, um, yeah. in this case, an emotional moment, I, I tend that's the impulse that drives me right. to go and, and write. And that's a poem. what I hear in there, and that's I think what poetry is all about: yes. capturing that time when we are most alive. Okay. Okay. More. Um, I'm going to switch now to my second collection, Fires in Sonoma, which is um, mainly about the dissolution of a long-term marriage, and this is the opening poem in the collection, Moving Day. I came back from a movie to a quiet house, folded laundry, began to distribute the still warm stacks. It was then that I noticed your shoe rack empty, clothes gone. I called to confirm you had moved out. No official notice, but then at this point, why stand on etiquette? After all, it was at my request and so long in coming. I hung up, explored my feelings like a bruise, a surface tenderness, an underlayer of broken capillaries. I set to cleaning, first the kitchen, then the breakfast room, living room, bedroom, bathrooms. By the time I was done, the house shone like a jewel in a bed of blue velvet. It wasn't until our daughter stopped in long enough to say she was going out for the evening that the rain began to fall, some woman's features crumpling into a wad of toilet paper. So this, I thought, is a marriage ending. After 25 years, I expected some thunderous exit, but instead there was silence, an empty house, empty drawers, the corner of a closet gray with dust. Mm, that will speak to many, many people who experience that. And to me, I wasn't divorced, but I know what loss feels like. And it's paradoxical. It's not what you think it's going to be. True. And kind of very... end, ended with a whimper and not a bang in this right, case. Right. Yeah. And, the, and the image of the bruise, that, which is something that happened brutally, but has a delicate spreading. Mm -hmm. Really. Thank you. Really powerful. More. All right, this is the title poem in the collection, Fires in Sonoma. Um, the title and the title of the collection comes from, in, in 2008, there was a, a huge wildfire up in Sonoma, and the result was that even Marin County was blanketed for about a week in this really heavy smoke. And it happened at about the same time that um, my marriage was disintegrating, we were separating, so I thought the, the fire 
was a good metaphor for what was happening, um, or, or appropriate metaphor for what was happening in my personal life. So, yeah. fires in Sonoma. Fires in Sonoma have blanketed the sky with a gray haze. Yesterday, the setting sun was a flat red coin above the horizon. For days now, I have hesitated to venture outside, knowing the air has grown toxic, is no longer good for me. I awaken slowly, sniff the lingering blaze, replace the gold bands on my left hand. I dress, step into a soft spot in the flooring, aware it will signal my movement to you, one floor below, in the house we've come to inhabit like borders. Now the battle over the bottle has flared once again. Your daily coughing begins, your muffling of it begins also, the disavowal of all the smoke-laid inroads into your lungs and heart. The children are asleep down the hall, measuring their breath, waiting for the walls to fall down around them. When and if the rupture comes, you'll pretend further that you had no idea, as if a wife moving to another part of the house was no, ca no cause for alarm, didn't rise to the level of a reasonable man's doubt. What to do when the air around you is no longer breathable? Hunker down, wait for offshore breezes to build off the golden gate. Get on your knees and pray for the storm that will wash the sky blessedly clean. It's so rooted in very ordinary things, and it's full of, it answers all the questions that I had. You know, it gives the clues in the poem, how come, what, and, but oh, beautifully, obliquely. So it Yes, is. it's personal work, but it, I think, I hope that it's universal too for people totally. who have experienced something similar. Oh yes, just the idea that you're breathing something that's supposed to give you succor and it's toxic. I mean, it's a terrible paradox of life. No, it's very universal, but I love the fact that it's so rooted in specifics. Thank you. More. All right. <clears throat> this is a love poem. Love is not always straightforward. An easy man to love. An easy man to love, but not an easy man to live with. Cute, but not cuddly. In fact, prickly, short-tempered, even on the best of days. Still, you're here most every night, a family man always anxious to get home. And in the vulnerable dark, the hands upon me are tender, considerate, even brave. Outside our kitchen window, your years of hard work have paid off. Effusions of dahlias, petunias, zinnias, basil, lettuce, strawberries, tomatoes. The sky overhead is changeable as you come in to me from the garden once again your hands full of thorns and roses. Mm. So, so rich with complexity. That's, that's you. amazing that you can encompass that in uh, the breath of a poem. Thank you. All right, well, I'm going to read El Toro, which of course means the bull. Yes. Um, this is a rhyming poem. I don't do a lot of these, but they're fun to write, and I like to read them when I go and do readings because um, a rhyming poem is easier to capture with the ear, of oh. course. Mm -hmm. So this is El Toro. Baby, my baby, my baby, my man, you blow up, you blow down, you drink from a can. You're off like a rocket, quick as a flare, flaming and burning, and see if I care. I'll love you forever, you know that it's true but I'm sick of pretending I don't see what I do. So grow up or go on, leave me alone. Watch as my years with you sink like a stone. Toro, El Toro, El Toro, it's time. You follow that red flag and I'll follow mine. Wow, where's the bass guitar? <laughs> would make a wonderful Spanish song. Spanish guitar, yes. <laughs> right, any kind of, it's a real um, song, like a country song of pain and <laughs> great. So we have about 10 minutes, okay. and I know you have Just more than that, but more. let's fill it with Terrific. poetry. Um, this is another Michigan poem about my childhood experience of a Midwestern winter, um, and it also has some larger themes like um, growing, getting older and, and death. When I awoke. When I awoke from childhood, the first thing I noticed was the cold. Up until then, it had been my benign companion, seven, eight long months of the year. I'd hardly pause to notice ten toes gone numb beneath an ice skate's white leather tongue, the stiffening of clumsy fingers under wet wool. 
Winter was the muffled sound of my father chipping away at ice grown an inch thick overnight on the windshield, and mornings dark and glossed as patent leather. My sisters and I in the Oldsmobile, waiting patiently, exhaling steam like kettles. At 13, my body began to tense with each waft of frigid air. The cold became a menace out to get me with shuddering fingers, turning capillaries on my bare legs into a map of pale purple. I dreaded winter's regal beauty, the front lawn sparkling like a sequined gown, my boots breaking through the crusted surface of snow, my regret at marring the imposter blanket, the thick and silent numbness come to bury us all. The imposter blanket and the, and the business of puberty and cold coming together like that. I mean, every, most people experience puberty as a kind of a wrench between what was so accepted and now everything feels weird. And so you got it very viscerally. I did. I felt it in my body, certainly, yeah. and yeah. why I ended up migrating to California, yes. obviously. <laughs> I yes. couldn't take the weather. Okay, another one, please. Okay. Bloom. This is a later-in-life blossoming poem about how every beginning encompasses uh, the end of something. Bloom. At first whiff, I come out smelling like a rose. But if you look closely, I'm disingenuous from the opening blush, and I'm sorry you were hurt in my subsequent unfurling. Persist if you must in willful misunderstanding, but this flowering was not, was never about you. It was about Phyllis and Michigan and dad and Catholicism, compulsion, martyrdom, and all the perversities that make me the thorny stemmed creature I am. And is that blossoming profound or just transiently pleasing? Too soon to tell, yet now I see that bringing anything to bloom requires getting dirty, knees soiled, panties bloodied, that even the pinkest of petals must eventually shrivel and grow dark, must loosen and fall, powdering every surface over with dust and ash. Mm, that says it. it really does. We have uh, seven minutes, so All right. choose your poems that oh will God. fit into that slot. Okay, well this is kind of a fun poem. This is about online dating, which I don't know if a lot of poems have been written about that topic so far, but they will be, certainly. Yes. yes. <laughs> so this is a woman dating at midlife. Touching our shaky optimism, so many bags and baggage brought along to this meeting exes, children, in-laws, houses, lawsuits, hurt feelings, health. Recalling my 20s, men falling from the sky, spilling out of restaurants and bars, workplaces, phone booths, taxi cabs. I sit at tables now, meeting appointed strangers. Warily we eye each other over cappuccinos, masking disillusion, dredging up semblances of our former people-pleasing selves. The men are often hard-eyed, cocky. Appreciating the turntables, they sit on money and power, letting me know they'd be doing me a favor dating someone their own age. We're searching for someone to grow old with, but who is willing to take that monumental gamble without 30 years of shared life to preface it? Then there's the skin, mottled, veiny, translucent. I realize now I never saw my husband as old, even as his hair turned white. Like a hologram, his 50-year-old self always contained the 24-year-old blonde I met on a train. Back at the cafe, a 50-something man stays a 50-something man. I stifle the urge to lift my hand, say, check please. I make a choice, lean in, search hard for the young man within. Mm. <laughs> I love that image of men raining out of the sky like that in the <laughs> Greek painting. Yes, yes, it felt that way in, yes. the, in the 20s, in our 20s, of course, but of course. things do change. Five minutes. All right, let's go back to Husk. Um, this is about an unhappy relationship and about the underlying psychology of it and a, a, of a couple who just keeps going back for more. It's called Hooked. Must he be his father so she will be his mother? Barb's aimed just so as they go through the motions, like kids at the piano, captive in the cultivation of talents they never cared to master. Like rats, pressing claws upon sweetened levers again and again, 
despite shocks, coming to love the metallic taste of their scant reward. Ooh. <laughs> you, you are an anatomist. You go right to the heart of, of wonderfully uncomfortable stuff and capture it, which I love. Uh, four minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, boy to man. <clears throat> the heft of your thigh, shocking. Could this be my toe-headed boy? Coarse, furtive, with laser perceptions, the assured possession of an old soul. Come, let me kiss your still sweet temple. Wrap veined hands round that strangely familiar sandpaper voice in the hall, calling out behind closed doors, good night. How do your kids feel about your poetry about them? <laughs> um, I have three children, um, two boys and a girl, and they're, uh, they like it. They like the attention. Um, my daughter, as she was going through her teen years, I wrote some that weren't quite so flattering about our, our, our relationship, about mm -hmm. both of us. and yeah. She found those a little hard to take, but um, I told her it was all just part of the process, and yes. so she's okay with it now. Right. I think they're excited to have a poet for a mother. Yes. I think as well they should be. They're, they're proud of me yes. and my writing, and um, uh, they are all good writers themselves, and my daughter uh -huh. seems to be pursuing that avenue, so that's Great. exciting to see. Yes. Um, three minutes. Right. The countdown. Oh gosh, do I have anything more here? I read that one. See, this is what happens when we shuffle through. Yeah, but it's the right one will show <clears throat> up. All right, hot stuff. There's a reference in this poem to the year 1979, which is around the time that I was in high school, and hot stuff was the number one hit single that year by Donna Summer. Some of you may recall it. Hot stuff. I think I'll get a tan or something similarly stupid. Pretend I'm 20 at the edge of an ocean of time and men. Worry about browning evenly, that white line on my shoulder. With the radio on, it's 1979. I feel the sun burn until you're just another freckle. Crave that drink I might take, I've been sober so long. You're only a dream I lie still to hold on to. You'll be sorry, you'll see, when I'm thoroughly bronzed. When heads turn, you will know what you are not missing. There's a song in that one <laughs> as well, definitely. Um, and perhaps one short one, sure and then one. we'll be done. But I want to keep going on because it's so rich. Okay. Well, you asked about my children and the dedication yes. to my first book. The uh, second book actually was a uh, dedication poem to my kids, uh, if I can find it. For my children, and you with your voices raised, drawing in the sweet air with your thin ribbed chests, then letting it out, filling the days until they press against that far horizon. Let the world hear your vibrant song. Let the silence break like a heart. Yes, and that, that's your poetry right there. And that's about the time that we have. That's, uh, that, that is another one of those exhortations telling us what we need, what, what, what will really work for us. Yeah, so let, you, let your voice be heard. Let your voice be heard and also honoring the silence, which is so much part of the poetry. So thank you for bringing your great poems of family and place and um, relationship to us. Thank They're you very much. Very grounded and very joyful. Much appreciated. Thank okay. you. Thank you.